Hi guys, welcome to another episode of De Elefort Daily Demos. Uh, today I would like to pick up and do a part two to this rendering or this drawing that we started the other day. Uh, this one point perspective and um, basically now we have the... <clears throat> I've, I've talked about some scale issues and how to scale furniture, how to place objects within that one point perspective. So I'd like to talk about a couple new concepts today or add to a couple concepts um, and things that I maybe begun to talk about the other day. One is to build on this uh, concept of the diagonal vanishing point or the control point which is uh, a line, a, a mark on the horizon line. And again, that uh, go back to video one, but that's the dimension from the vanishing point to the lowest corner of the room, back corner of the room when we get the drawing started. We take that dimension up to the horizon line and then repeat that dimension out here and we get that diagonal vanishing point. And what that is, is a line coming through and it helps us establish proportions for a square. So what we really have is a line cutting through our square. And remember over here I diagrammed a square, or what is a representation of our grid. So we have our lines in this case going off to in one direction, in other words towards our, our um, horizontal, this would be horizontal across the grid while these are going towards our vanishing point and then we have this diagonal which is going off to this uh, diagonal vanishing point here on the right. So what we have is a, a square that has got a bisection line down the middle and what that also tells us is the opposite perpendicular direction would, would go from opposite corner to opposite corner. So if we go into our grid here and if our grid is built reasonably accurately I'll grab a straight edge to be able to diagram or show this a little bit better. So if we go into our grid and we plot corner to corner through the boxes, um, we should wind up with a reasonably accurate line through the grid in this direction. And that's perpendicular to the base direction over here to the right. So what we now have is an overlap of a two point and a one point system entering into our perspective. So what we have over here, if we continue this line, and if your grid's not 100% perfect, it's okay. Just try to, try to take several squares, what you know as a representation of a square, take several of those and sort of average out if there's a little discrepancy between them. You should wind up with pretty good intersections um, along the grid all the way along. And what I now have is a representation, and that's going to go, I know that's going to go off the video out here. I may be off the frame of the video. Very close, I guess. Um, it's going to go out here to the far left. I'm going to continue the horizon line off to the left. And if it's off the screen, I, I apologize for that, but effectively, you should have a new vanishing point. I think I may be just within the screen today. Um, anyway, it's where the horizon line and this diagonal line intersect on the horizon line. I now have a new diagonal vanishing point. So what I have now is an overlap of two-point perspective combined with the one-point perspective, which is extremely useful for being able to make things feel more natural. So if we want to make, um, uh, let's put sort of a, an end table next to this chair um, using the diagonal vanishing point, so it's literally rotated 45 degrees from the wall and rotated relative to the chair. So what that means is it's going to come through, I'm going to use a longer straight edge here. <clears throat> there we go. I'm going to go off of the left vanishing point and let's just say I want to place it over here somewhere next to the, the chair. So you can certainly use uh, anywhere your grid lines up is very very helpful. So for example right here right through the grid there, off to the right, I can use a shorter straight, straight edge here, sort of like that, and off in that direction. And you can eyeball now how deep do you want to make it. You could eyeball, do you feel like it's a square over here um, in your grid, or if it needs to be a little bit longer in the right direction or not. So at this point, we now have a representation of a box on the ground. It's rotated. You can see it's intersecting our four corners of that uh, of the larger square. So it's it's a reasonable bisection, sort of like this. I'm going back over to our little orthographic diagram here, sort of a bisection uh, rotated 
um, box, something like that. So now to build some height, go back to, you know, at this point we could start to sketch. Um, and I really do want to uh, layer into this some sketching work, but I want to lay in a little bit of uh, precision, I guess, to help you guys who are just starting out understand proportions and heights. So I can start to build this box vertically right here. I know it's very difficult to kind of see this stuff early on especially. I know our brain does not want to trust that that is the correct length compared to that, but the geometry tells us it is. So we're going to trust that, okay? The system, trust the system. Um, your two parts of your brain are going to be battling each, each other until you learn um, the rules of perspective for shortening and get comfortable with uh, kind of letting go of it, actually. If we want to try to establish some height, you know, you can, I can track any one of these vertical edges over to the wall. And I already have a grid line that's a vertical height here. So if I want this uh, end table to be just 12 inches off the floor, that's 12 inches. If I want to make it 18, that would be halfway between the 2 feet and the 1 foot, that's 18 inches. I may make this a little bit taller, but not quite 18 inches. I think 18 seems to me to be a little bit high. I'm going to measure this uh, end table over here, actually 19 inches. So let's do 18. 18 is pretty reasonable, I guess, for a, a little sidebar table. So I'm going to take this height right here on the wall and carry that over. Again, I'm following the same line across the floor horizontally to this edge. And now I have the height of the object here. I'll go from the right van now the new right vanishing point, which is the diagonal vanishing point. Bring that out forward. And now I go off to the left vanishing point. Apologize for the sniffling I'm doing today. I'm having a little bit of allergies uh, with the pollen. So um, I just took some medicine. Hopefully that'll kick in a little bit. Anyway, so we're going to go across this way. And from this corner over here, and I can connect these uh, these edges, and the opposite back edge of the table is right there. So that's a little rotated cube, rotated perspective cube. Again, if anything looks a little bit weird, just double check your work. Make sure you went to the right control point. I did. Looks a little tweaked. It looks a little weird, kind of, to our our mind, but it's technically correct. So we're gonna we're gonna live with it. So at this point, it might be nice to start to add some table depth uh, in one direction or another, maybe add the legs. And I'm going to switch up now to going to graphite uh, rendering, because I think it's a very important skill uh, for designers, young designers and young artists, to develop um, some graphite values before they sink themselves deep, deep into their rendering. They can start to explore values and quality and character. You have to make some choices. This is not a demo that's fully um, going to get into light logic principles and concepts, but a little bit. You have to make some choices about what are your dominant light sources. And in this case, if it's daylight out, then the window would be a pretty dominant light source. So I could start to do some things like I could say, well, this edge of the ceiling up here might cast a shadow down the wall like that, that little uh, soffit. And this edge of the soffit will also cast a shadow down the wall. And then I can plot a point, and I'm just going to eyeball a point here. And then I'm going to carry that line across the ceiling here. Now I've got lights up on the ceiling too, recessed lights. So that there could be an opportunity here for a double shadow. Over on the opposite side of the room, I could do the same sort of thing. I could just eyeball a little streak down here, and I could start to render this a little bit darker in the back with the pencil. And again, I'm going to come up here to the ceiling. I can also create a little shadow effect up here on the ceiling from that wall, that edge of the wall. I could do the same thing down here on the floor, add a little bit of a shadow kind of moving away. Um, and we can even double that shadow. We could say, well, there's windows over on this side of the room. Remember, we expanded the room off to the the left, so I could say that this is creating a little shadow over here. We can also start to give suggestions of reflections. You know, I'm going to go in and go ahead and erase this little guy. Remember, this guy was in our first video, the common error guy here. I'm going to erase that guy because it's a little bit distracting now that I'm developing my, my sketch here. 
Uh, I like to use kneaded erasers. I think I may have talked about this before. They are wonderful, especially on trace paper. This is Bond I'm working on it uh, on today. Um, but especially on trace paper, they prevent all the uh, graphite from smudging nearly as much when you try to erase um, compared to some other types of erasers. So I'm highly, I highly recommend a kneaded eraser. If you're not familiar with these, they're like putty or, or like kind of like cookie dough or something. Uh, stretch them out a little bit, get them kind of warmed up. Once the rubber is warmed up, like that, um, they work beautifully. You can also just take them along and you can just literally lift graphite off of the page like that. So there's all that graphite is being transferred onto the kneaded eraser. Can't really do this with most other um, eraser types. So at this point I'm just starting to think about uh, some shadows and lighting and values. Um, I could certainly go in and develop these uh, these bars on the handrail. And for now, this is just a rough study. So I'll just go ahead and start to sketch these. I drew them in a little bit hard with the uh, straight edge the other day. But I can certainly come in and start to frame around the figures, what's going to leak through the figures. I can also take these vertical structural supports of the beams or the bars. Start to render those in a little bit tighter, with a little more depth. So what I'm thinking of here is that this handrail, the lighting is very dominant and bright outside. So the back side of this handrail is going to receive or be sort of backlit. And that means I can make that a bit darker in my sketch. Uh, along this back plane. Now the top plane, I'm trying to leave that left uh, left out or left white a little bit. So you're going to want to practice the concept and the principles of, um, of value studies. It's a really, really important principle in drawing and in rendering. But the sooner you get started with this kind of gesturing in and suggesting a little bit of landscape, Maybe perhaps consider that there's a tree outside the house here, the building or the apartment um, with some tree branches sort of sticking out. Try not to get into the habit of overdrawing trees and things like that, especially in a quick little study. We can easily overdraw things like that. I'm going to go in and talk about some, something else here. I'd like to put some curtains in here. And we have to start to think about how do curtains... Um, how do curtains uh, anchor to the ceiling? Is it with a curtain rod or is it with a uh, like a reveal against the back wall? So we could have a ceiling, in other words, that pulls back, back here, and we are standing in the room, we're looking up, and we don't see how the curtain attaches to the ceiling up here. So it could be, and this is our glass wall, so I'm sort of diagramming over on the side. I encourage you guys to diagram, do side views, so you get a better idea of what you're trying to represent. So we could have curtains that literally disappear um, behind this edge. I'd probably pull that, if that's my ceiling, I'd pull that edge down. In other words, maybe in line with this soffit line. So I might start to build out a little soffit plane in the foreground. Let me pull it up here. So just bring your mechanics forward, across. If you have to make little adjustments to like this wind, this light, for example, it's no pro no problem. Oops, I'm trying to keep my basic structural lines in blue for you, so you can see it a little bit better. Did I make a mistake? I made a mistake. Okay, and then I'm going to put a little, little plane right here. Not a big mistake, not huge. When I sketch my graphite, it's going to cover that little mistake. So it's very hard to see this in the video. Maybe if you zoom in or enlarge the video, you'll see I've created a little suggestion. There's a little airspace between this soffit plane. So I'm going to shade in this under plane. So this is one of the important things of starting to work in value contrast and things with your, um, with your graphite pencil. 
I'm going to erase that tree. You're no longer going to see that tree up there. I'm going to erase that shadow line even. We're not going to see that anymore either. And then I can actually come up here and sketch in that shadow line down the wall. And this is something that you don't have to know a lot about shadow casting. It certainly helps. You don't have to really know a lot about it. You can observe this in your home or apartment um, every day. Your shadows come down from a windowsill or from the header of your window down the wall. They kind of streak down. If it looks a little tight here, then just kind of drape, drape it down the wall a little bit steeper. I'm going to put a little more contrast against this wall plane here at the top, and then I'm going to fade it off. Now, I talk a lot about, and you might see me doing a little bit of scribbling, or what looks like scribbling. I want to encourage you to break your mental um, habit of scribbling. We sometimes get frustrated, or we feel like we have a large area to cover of, of uh, value and we will rush that your brain will rush that and turn your hand motion into a scribble so I'm going to talk about technique here you have to practice crosshatch technique which is effectively just simple straight lines from one edge to another clean evenly spaced you can always come back in the opposite direction to create more density practice crosshatching you can certainly space them out further to create like a gradation. Um, and it is the core, even when I'm feathering my pencil, cross-hatching is still the core of the motion and the stroke. And it helps prevent you from doing little scribbly lines as you're working. I'm going to give us, um, so before I get too far along here, um, I was talking about curtains hanging from up here, perhaps. And so I'm going to just go ahead and start to sketch vertical lines. The, the edge of the floor of the room is right here. So let me put that line in a little bit stronger with the graphite so you can see it on the video a little bit better. Like that. Okay. So what I like to do for curtains is I like to really just do very easy movements up and down, and this is pretty a pretty long stroke here. Give yourself little spaces. Let there be imperfections. Your line work does not have to be perfectly straight, and in fact, I would encourage you to not try to use your straight edges, your triangles, and just let these, you know, uh, strokes be a little bit light, a little bit free, and don't be afraid of air gaps and spaces and press in on your pencil. I can't encourage it enough or express it enough. Beginning designers and artists have a fear of putting depth into their drawings. It's a shame because it's really one of the best things that you can learn to leverage is contrast. All right. So the sooner you get on board with that, the better and the richer and the more dynamic, and the more dimensional your, your uh, spaces will look. So right now, because I've rendered all this through that curtain, or I've already drawn that all through that curtain, this starts to look like a scrim or a, a, a light kind of veil curtain. And then I just take these little shapes at the bottom. I know that this is maybe barrel rolls kind of uh, of the curtains at the, at the floor. And I can start to develop that little shape, a little bit of shadow between the curtain and the floor. Uh, even if, it's, if the curtain is a white curtain, it's going to create a shadow, and that's what we've alluded to here. Even if it's a scrim, it's a, a thin veil type of shadow, um, or a curtain, then it's going to give us that kind of quality. Now, it's also going to create a shadow across the floor, so I can actually start to suggest that this is a little bit duller. I can also dull down this wall a little bit, because again, if it's a thin, a thin light veil of a curtain, it's still filtering out the light. And that's where this contrast up above is really helpful. A solid versus a transparent or translucent type of material, like a, a thin um, scrim type of curtain. So I'm just starting to shade in the, the shadow that might be caused by that across the floor. I can also incorporate sh vertical sh uh, reflections. So in a horizontal plane like the floor, vertical lines carry straight down. So all these little shadow values of the curtain itself can literally just come straight down into the floor. I start with the shadows first. If I need to add a little highlights, then I can always do that later. In graphite, this could be enough. 
and that gives us a suggestion of the reflection of the floor plane. And while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and give the same idea that maybe this end plane of this wall creates a little bit of a reflection in the floor as well. So if you have polished floors, or semi-polished floors, even hardwood floors that have a little bit of a, a polyurethane finish or something to finish or to seal it, you're going to get some sort of reflection. And you don't have to plot mass a lot of points and map out the actual distances. You can just simply carry some value down and let it fade off. From time to time, you will see me do a little stroke like this, and then I'll do a little swish kind of thing. Uh, try to relax your hand, practice that. Try to think about it before you get started uh, when you're sketching and rendering. So the figures here, this child, I could start to just render in the child. I don't have to spend too much energy on what the kid is wearing. Um, I'm not interested in that at the moment. This is just a little study. I like to give a little bit of light around the edge, uh, maybe give you know a suggestion that there's light coming from the in this case from the left and uh, these other two figures so again don't be afraid to push in let your hands have you know these are suggestions of wrinkles in the pants it's nice you don't have to get too caught up with what their position their body position is um, again this is cross hatching I'm doing it's just very very fast because I've been doing it for a long time so I have a quicker hand do not try to cheat speed or practice. Um, in other words, speed comes with practice. And all too often, we get impatient and we don't want to uh, spend the time to do our strokes nice and even and clean. And so we wind up rushing and it winds up really looking pretty bad. Okay, so practice uh, being patient and speed will come with practice. Uh, what I'm doing now is my, I'm starting to lay down a bit of graphite and you can see my hand is getting a little bit of, of graphite dirt on it. You can use the kneaded eraser to pick that up. You can also grab a um, piece of trace paper or a piece of bond paper from your printer, any clean sheet of paper. This is a scrap piece of a, a cut off of a, of a book cover uh, or a paper cover. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to use this as a masking for my hand so my hand does not dirty up my my sketch here a little bit so again the figures at the moment I'm not too concerned about their uh, their their uh, garments their clothing or who's a guy who's a male who's a female or what they're wearing there's no you know discretion in that regard at, at the moment um, and I can always come back and add uh, or use um, uh, entourage tracings if you're not that good with anatomy, that's fine. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it's sort of a gift for some people and very difficult for others. But for the moment, I can certainly represent them sort of backlit, in other words, or front, frontally lit. Therefore, um, they're very relatively dark in the composition. So starting to develop this, I'm going to come back up here to the ceiling to start to articulate this plane. Now. One of our important concepts is plane contrast. We like to say one, two, three plane contrast, but the important thing, an interior space obviously has more than three planes. That, that system, that rule kind of works well for industrial designers, product designers, where you very often draw your objects in what's known as a three-quarter view, meaning you could see the top plane of the object, you could see two vertical planes of the object all at the same time. So, in interior, we clearly have far more than just two planes that we are seeing at any given time. So, it's a very important value or concept and principle. Uh, but you do, at some point, need to develop contrast between way more than three planes. But at any given moment, there may only be two or three planes to think about. So, this is an underplane, that's an underplane. Those are both the same value more or less. So I'm going to just push in a little bit more value so that feels like it's in the same plane as this one. And I'm going to smooth this out. Now sometimes with our lights we like to create a little cast line like this. This is kind of like think of the light casting off in a cone kind of shape and it's hitting the wall over here. So outside the shape of the lamp 
I can render everything a little bit darker. If I went a little bit dark here, I can back it off with my kneaded eraser. It does need a little bit of value, but I really want to emphasize the contrast around that lamp in this case. Remember, work on the, 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 uh, the profile edge of objects like cylinders that are cutting up inside, so that leading edge or that this edge is our profile edge in this case. So again, a little bit of value on that underplane, right through here even, and then I have to build a little bit more contrast around it, so I'm going to just change the direction of my, my rendering sketch here, and I get cross at you basically through there and you start to see the contrast emerging from this process. If you change your directions just get back to the direction that you you left off in other words this is the angle where I left off my cross hatching. Nothing wrong with that you don't have to have like a specific rule for how the right way to do is. I did a little fade off transition swish there coming back to this direction my eye is just always looking for places where can I create a little more value contrast and refine my shapes. In other words, the shape of a circle is an ellipse in perspective. Take a look at that other video on my channel, the Fort Daily Demos here, and hopefully that helps with the forms of ellipses and cylinders. Okay. Some of my videos, I know, uh, don't have any audio. Those were some early tests. I was just trying to figure some things out. Um, I will come back and reshoot some of those videos with, with audio, uh, reproduce them so that there's a bit more clarity in the instruction and all that stuff for you. Um, so there's some values for that soffit plane. Um, I'm going to go ahead and erase this light source right there. It's a little too close to the, the soffit plane up here now. So there's our, there's our shapes and our forms. We could start to push in this table perhaps. Uh, has like a little darker plane right here. The chair, if this is a reflected, reflective surface, I'm going to erase some of this. I'm going to start to sketch in the three planes of our table here. The chair might be reflecting into the floor. It could give a little suggestion of that reflection into the floor. And our table is also going to create a reflection into the floor too. So I'm just carrying those lines of the legs down. I'm going to ignore this foreground figure because I don't want to block the object too much. The verticality of this chair is going to be a reflection in that table if it's a reflective table, if it's got a reflective surface. Um, so there's a, a table. I can start to put in a vase. I'm going to shift it a little bit to the left. Uh, sorry, to the right here. So it's not blocking the, the chair so much. And then core shade logic of, of cylinders comes into play. So there's the core shade. And that means the back side of the cylinder is a little bit darker. In other words, bounce light over here. And the base value needs to have a value as well, the base value of the, of the, of the cylinder. So, I'm now putting in a little bit of value for the reflections and I'll put that reflection back for the chair over here and I'll kind of leave that alone and I'll put some kind of plant sticking up out of the planter, the pot and I don't have to really think about as a specific kind of plant, I'm just drawing what are like little flower buds and leaves and a little bit of life to it. So much easier than trying to gesture or trying to draw every detail. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sketch in the tree a little bit more and you could certainly layer in little textural kind of shapes and changes um, and deeper values, some darker shadows in here even though this is the light coming through here I might want to let that burn out a little bit through there through where the cone shape is uh, the, the tree trunk is in the uh, in the light a little bit here, it's on the other side of that handrail uh, and it disappears from our view all too often one of the biggest mistakes I see with people and working on their landscape type of things is we try to squeeze a big tree. Trees are 20, 30, 40 feet tall, 60 feet tall if they're palm trees. We try to take this big giant tree and squeeze it into the, the, the window. And I would caution against that. I'd rather make a mistake um, 
and let it be sort of just a suggestion of some landscaping than to make it look like a cartoon. So I'm always in favor of a little bit more realism than cartoonism. Um, we can start to develop the, the rendering over here. The ceiling plane needs values. Uh, if this is our light cast coming down like this, I may start to render this plane up here a little bit darker. <clears throat> Sorry for the pop in my voice there. <clears throat> a little bit darker. And I want to get contrast between my planes, so I may fade it off. I may need to start to develop my ceiling plane as well. Get comfortable with a direction that you can make a nice long line, and then you can do a little swish off like that. Take some practice to get comfortable doing that. I'm going to redevelop that angle right there. I could go through the light source. The, the ceiling plane needs value still, but I always want to get that contrast. So. You can work into it. You don't have to just jump right into dark tones that may be very intimidating. And then over here, I need a little bit of contrast to this vertical plane as well. So I'm changing the direction and the angle. And the number one thing is, did I get contrast between this vertical plane, the horizontal under plane? And I'm a little bit out of the natural position. You can see some curving happening to my strokes and that's because this is not a natural uh, pencil position or arm position for my drawing. I would encourage you to take your paper off of the page, off of the sheet, take it off the tape, take it off your drawing board, take the tape off your drawing board and um, spin the paper around in the natural direction your hand wants to make a, a stroke, a line. We all have a tendency to arc our hands and what you're trying to do is resist and fight that so that you use arcs when you need them. <clears throat> it's part of your arsenal, but that you're not uh, arcing every single line. I'm going to give this little television, I'm going to dull this television down a little bit here. Some things uh, I may have talked about last time is if the wall has some reflectivity, that handrail right there may be a little bit of a reflection in there. This underside soffit may be a reflection in there, so I can give a suggestion of that and just give it a little bit of a, almost like it's an eggshell kind of finish in the wall. Uh, so you can start to develop some qualities and character, character qualities into your, into your rendering uh, all the way through. Uh, we could put an area rug over here. Let's just do an area rug around the chair here. On the other side of the chair, I'm just gonna use my grid um, to develop a little area rug. The back side of this area rug might be a little bit darker. If it's a little bit textured, go ahead and wiggle your pencil line a little bit. It'll make it feel a little bit more toothy and texturized. I'll kind of pick that up over here. And you can even let your pencil skip along a little bit. It makes it look a little bit more natural than just a hard-edged ob object like a, like a piece of furniture, like a table or a chair that might be made of uh, wood or metal or something like that. And then I just... Well, now if it's an area rug around this, I'm not going to have reflections in here, am I, from the table. Okay, so mirror reflection logic is I'm just barely grazing over the topic at the moment or the subject. It's an area that you're going to want to tap into. The shadows of the folks, the people in the, in the room certainly would come across the, 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 uh, the floor and, and also the carpet. So I can add a little bit more of that their suggestion in there. This reflection, the height of this line right here, I can, I can measure that line down here. I can also eyeball it in this case. There would be a reflection there. And then the vertical edge or this vertical plane is going to return or resume back to that left vanishing point. So I can give a certain suggestion to that reflection appearing here in the, the lower floor. And then also the underside of this table is a very dark plane. So that's an opportunity to darken up the reflection down here a little bit more. Give it a suggestion of the underside of the table. But again, the carpet is not going to create a ref capture a reflection unless it's some kind of weird uh, metallic silver kind of uh, carpet or something. But um, I like to use carpets as an area, an opportunity to create, you know, um, an abstract modern pattern of some sort. Again, you don't have to get overly deep in, in that suggestion, but it's certainly a lot easier to draw than a very complex uh, Persian rug or something like that. So um, for 
especially for very quick studies like this, um, I just want to give a suggestion of, of a carpet and an area rug here. I don't want to get overly bogged down in that, um, the detailing of that at the moment. So my ellipses, I'm going to go ahead and erase that out a little bit so you can see the, the geometry of the carpet. carpet. And I'm burning in this line right here, this edge, because it's away from the light source again. So I'm getting more contrast into my, into my scene, okay? So that's a little bit of rendering and graphite study. And I really encourage all of my students, get into the graphite study early. Um, and before you commit to your marker rendering, uh, where you're more prone to making mistakes or more intimidated, uh, quite frankly, uh, you just get more intimidated by the fact that you're working in marker and it's uh, maybe a little more unforgiving. You can't erase it. I'm going to come in here. I'm starting to put in window, like glass, seamless glass. If the glass has got a little bit of emollient, you can certainly develop that. That's nice. Create a little bit more contrast. If the emollients maybe come across the top over here. A door, typical door height in America is about six feet eight inches to the rough opening. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven feet, six feet six, six feet nine or so is right there. Uh, that would be a very common door height. If we want to make it a little bit taller, a little bit more grand, we could start to start to put that line in across here. Maybe these are French doors, so they're about two and a half feet each or two feet each even. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make two doors that are two and a half. There's one two and a half and another two and a half. That puts it right there, which is a very nice compositional place for me uh, in relation to the people. So this double door is now, uh, it's, it would be a six foot opening if you had both doors open. I wonder if I have enough time in this video to actually give the suggestion of, so I'm going to continue this beam across the top and through the curtain even, I'm going to just kind of stagger it a little bit as if we don't see all of it because it's cutting through the curtain. In other words, the curtain disrupts it a little bit. Uh, very typically on a door like this, again, the frame is maybe blacked out. This frame will get, continue up to the ceiling and if I want to find the center of the door, the center of the door is right about here. Feels a little corporate style to me at the moment, so if it was more of a, a home, maybe I'd want to thin out some of these lines or develop them a little bit further. Certainly I could add from the vanishing point, I can add a little bit of depth to these mullions. So I can certainly, that disappears up above, I can bring that forward a little bit so I can start to add that third dimension, which is really, really important. Students all too often forget the third dimension of their objects and their shapes. So there's a little dimension here, barely, barely visible, but I'd like to give a quick suggestion of it with the line. And I'm gonna see the underside of this mullion up here. I'll try and keep my head out of the video. So I get a little bit more dimensional quality out of the, the frames now. Don't forget, if you've got shadows on the floor and they're kicking off in a, in a direction, then these little edges, the edge of the, the door is going to appear across the floor. The edge of that mullion is going to appear across the floor. Cut it through behind things. Um, again, I'm going to start to develop this shading on the wall. Um, I could develop the value of the wall. The wall needs some kind of value. Every surface has value. The brightest thing might be the window but I need to develop the values. If I have these little light casts on the wall over here on the right, then the area outside of those little bumps gets a little bit more value than the area in the bump because that's in the light. So I'm gonna just kinda, I'm sketching my mind through this um, as much as I'm sketching my pencil through it, but I'm sketching to get my brain wrapped around the values of the, of the textures and the character of the wall and things. As we get farther from the light sources, you can start to put more value down below, down by the floor. And you can kind of fade that as it comes up the wall. You'll observe that in most spaces as well. And if you feel like you're losing the shape, burn in your profile line a little bit stronger on the pot and things like that too. So we just keep developing and pushing in. 
we had this figure outside over there. Maybe I'll put another person next to them real quick. And again, they're kind of backlit because they're in the same sun angle orientation as the other pre folks are. Uh, and so as, as soon as I'm starting to cast the shadows to the right, then we know that the light is coming from the south or from the left, sorry. Uh, if we're in the northern hemisphere, which we are here in California, then it's coming from the left. So again, don't be afraid of putting values into your sketch and rendering. And if you don't have any idea what you're sketching at any given moment, just have a try to start to ad lib it. Think about, oh, these might be the waves of, and the sand and the ocean lapping in. Um, uh, as we come in closer to shore, some of that value might appear through the curtain here a little bit. So that's just reinforcing that this is a scrim kind of curtain. And you could fade those values off as you get farther away and things like that. So you don't have to overthink uh, every detail. Um, I would caution you get away from the idea of drawing airplanes and birds in your scenes. You don't need it. Uh, a lot of times, unless you do a really good job with it, it just looks really gimmicky and hokey. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put some of these other verticals in here really quick for the handrail. You will notice I bounce around a lot. And I think it's very important that you do that. You allow your brain to do that. Your brain will work in some you know erratic ways. Just go with it. Learn to leverage that. Come back. Reread the drawing figure out what it's missing, revisit pieces. So I'm looking at these little uh, standards coming down, meeting the ground, they need little shadows at the base. This edge is gonna be a little shadow across the balcony here. So I, know, I can start to belt, develop that. The handrail is gonna be a shadow across here. So I know, I know those things. I know those things not because I know uh, shadow casting logic, which I do. However, I know those things more because I observe it every day. And the best tool for learning is taking the concepts and the principles and find everywhere you can observe uh, those behaviors in your real, your day-to-day -day life. Whether it's a desk lamp on the table or whether it's a day at the beach or driving to work, looking at Chrome logic and things, whatever it happens to be, look for those opportunities where you can connect one kind of thing to another thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clean up this chair a little bit. My light logic is a little off on that. I do want to produce a little bit better logic. There's a little bit of a curvature. This is the back edge of that chair. If the light is coming dominantly from outside, then that would be the darker of the darker area of the curvature. That gets this other half of that seat to kind of emerge. So, this was a really quick drawing the other day. All of these drawings are very very quick. I'm trying to get them in within a timeline that I can actually save them on my on my camera and not have to come back and do a lot of post production editing and things like that so I have to work within the memory card limits okay so that's a little bit of graphite rendering and development it's a way of thinking about your work one more thing we are at 43 minutes uh, I hope I don't run out of time here one more thing if we are doing hardwood floors uh, on the floor I think I talked about that before uh, I like to do like little wavy kind of shapes and think about like little knots in the wood. Depending on the type of wood, if it's bamboo, it's going to have a slightly different texture and character. Let that value, that character that you're drawing, have resonance in the center of the scene and then let it fade off as you get farther to the back of the room. You're not going to see it back there. You can see I'm adding in reflections of those mullions back in. Those kind of details are really beautiful. But the wood grain on the floor it's just going to move along, so spend your energy detailing in the foreground where somebody can really see it and en enjoy it, um, but in the distance, it's just going to fade off. And, even, and, the, and what I mean by the distance is not just the distance going away from us, but also off to the right of the scene. There's not much need for me to draw every little grain of hardwood floor over here on the right or way over here on the left. But what is important in this case is that these move towards our vanishing point, okay? So our wood grain is moving in that direction. I don't have to spend a lot of time in detailing this stuff that's way over here on the right, okay? But as I get to the middle of the scene, this is where I do want to develop a little bit more character and dimension. 
As you get to uh, the edges of your scene, fade off, practice letting go, okay? You do not need to render all the way to the edge of your paper. In fact, I would advise you not to do that. If you're rendering this plane over here, this vertical wall, just think about what, what is it you're trying to say by rendering this wall, and then practice letting that fade off over here. I like to give my students a rule of thumb, a couple fingers in from the edge of the paper, start to turn off your rendering, okay? So you're not winding up, all too often we start to render this floor plane, we get out here in the, in the, in the foreground, and we get all the way to the edge of the paper, and we never know when to stop the, the, the drawing or the rendering. So just like I was doing up here, let it fade off. Um, same thing with the ceiling. So you can give yourself a, bar, a border, a margin, an edge. You know, you, these are some stylization tricks that you can develop and practice. But a general rule of thumb, you know, just learn to back off, okay? Um, so if I'm rendering this plane right here, uh, I start to get close to this edge over here, it's close to the edge of the paper, within a couple fingers, and I'm just going to fade that guy off. So, giving the expression of a wall reflection here, I can develop that. Again, pencil work can be really loose and rough and quick and free, um, and it's a way of thinking, how am I going to proceed when it comes to my final rendering? Alright, I hope that helps. Uh, that's graphite rendering. Rotated objects within a one-point perspective, overlapping two different systems a little bit. And uh, values, light logic, shadow casting logic, all that is relevant. And just keep practicing and it gets easier and easier. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.